Thank good to be able to come and worship God today. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hey. I'll uh, get you if you've got your Bibles to go to uh, Genesis chapter 4, um, verse 7. And from there we're going to flip over to Jonah chapter 3 and verse 10. God's so good to us, isn't he? Yes. Hallelujah. What a tremendous presence of the Lord in this place. The songs and the, the, everything that they've sung today has just been so appropriate, I think. I think God just began to move from the very beginning of this service. And you can feel his presence in this place. And uh, just so you know, our knowledge of God is not dependent upon our feelings. That's right. Amen. But it sure is nice when we can feel it. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm going to live for God regardless of whether He comes into another service or not. I'm going to still keep living for Him regardless of whether I feel His presence. And, uh, and But it sure is wonderful when God's presence comes in and you can feel that and know that His presence is here. I, uh, I pray that you came to the altar in faith. Believing that uh, that you were going to be healed and that God was going to touch you and that God did. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. Uh, you'll recognize this one verse probably very, pretty quickly. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, then sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, just going to go a little different direction. I heard this preached one time from somebody who had some knowledge of Hebrew. And he said that that part that says, If thou doest not well, and sin lieth at the door, had actual two meanings in the original. One is, of course, that sin lies at the door to take and devour you, and which I preached about that. But the other one is that sin offering lieth at the door. And so that is where I'm going to go with today is, is that particular one. Let's go to Jonah chapter uh, 3 and verse 10. And again, most of you know the story of Jonah. Uh, we're going to read one verse from here and then we'll pray. It says, And God saw their works that they had turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. And I preached to you on the subject of seeking for mercy. Yeah. And let's pray, shall we? Thank you, Lord, so very much. Jesus, your presence has been so precious in this house. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I know, Jesus, that at the beginning when you provided this building, this property, for this church in Port Alberta. God, you made some promises through prophecy, through your word, that your eyes and your ears would be on this place. Your eyes upon those that would enter in. Your ears would be attentive. Yes. God, to the worship and the praise and the prayers that were raised in this house. So, Lord, we know that you are here, that you are attentive to the needs of your people here today. But, Lord, for myself, I just love the feel of your presence. Yes. I love feeling that warmth that comes over me whenever I just feel you touch me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. No, Lord, that you have come here, Jesus, to meet the needs of your people. Yes. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Pray, Lord, that you will continue, Lord, to just be here. God, I know there are needs within this congregation. Pray, Lord, that you will just walk down the aisles between the pews. Touch each one, young and old, Lord, by your spirit. Do what is needed in each one of our lives. Anyone who comes into church today, God, we know that each one of us have needs. So, God, I pray that you will just meet the needs of your people here today. And Lord, that you will just fulfill in them their calling, that calling that you have placed upon their lives. In Jesus' precious name. Everybody say amen. Yeah. amen. amen. Hallelujah. <coughs> amen. You may be seated in Jesus' name. What a great day it is out there. Yes. Amen. All of you are probably anxious to get out. Enjoy uh, the sunshine out there. and Maybe enjoy family and so forth. That 
For some of you, it will be a long weekend if you've taken Monday off as well as Tuesday. And others will be uh, a short week because your work week will be divided up by Tuesday. And uh, so we get to go out there. I'm looking forward to uh, I'm looking forward to enjoying this next time. We've had a lot of rain in the last five months. Amen. You don't notice that? I know they've had all kinds of floods and various things over on the uh, on the other coast across the water from us and West Van and that. And uh, I think we've been spared a little bit of that. I'm thankful for that. Port McNeil lost their bridge. What's that? Port McNeil lost their bridge. Port McNeil lost their bridge. Yeah. So it's been all around us, and, and we've gotten a good share of it, too. I want to preach to you today about, about seeking for mercy. Uh, maybe from a little different perspective than what you would think, because uh, most of the time when we think about seeking for mercy, uh, we think about ourselves and our need for mercy in our lives. And just, you know, I can look around here today, and all of us have a need of mercy in our lives, don't we? We, got, we need God's mercy. Because all of us err and we make mistakes. Anybody in this ever in this church here, is leadership or anybody else, ever brings you to the feeling like they they don't struggle with things in their life? It's only because that they have not come to an understanding realization that God is still working in their lives to become more like Him. That's right. That is the goal. And none of us have achieved that perfection that is in Jesus Christ as yet. At least in looking around you, I can. <laughs> I can usually tell that in some area of your life. I can always tell it in my own life. Right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and so we all have a need of mercy. So in seeking for mercy, uh, I want you to know today that all of us have a need of God's mercy in our life. We can we can look at uh, a person's character and determine a person's character in their lives by their actions. If a person says that they're honest but lies, then you know that that's really not a character quality that they have. Right. If a person says they're going to be faithful and then are not faithful, that is also a, you can make that determination that they're not faithful by, by their actions and by what they do. It's the same with God. We can determine God's character by his actions, by the decisions that he makes, how he treats people, how he reacts to situation and circumstances. Uh, we can determine and we can know what the character of God is, or at least in part. And I know that we're never going to know God in all his completeness until we get to be with him. Right. For the Bible says at that time we will know him, uh, for we shall see him as he is. And, uh, but it, now we know in part. Amen. And now we see in part. And so now we we are able to see portions of the character of God that He chooses to reveal to us. Right. At least clearly enough so that we would be able to understand and be able to know it. And to some extent, some of it is, is probably uh, of not knowing God is not so much that God doesn't want to reveal Himself to us, but I think it's sometimes our perception is limited by that vision of now we see in part and know in part. I think we are skewed to some degree in our knowledge and understanding of God, mostly because our minds are so limited and our thoughts are, are, are not His thoughts. And, and they're way above us, the Bible says, and way beyond our understanding. But suffice it to say, we can hold confidence in this. That God will reveal to us and help us to understand enough of Him that we will make it to that place where we will see Him, know Him as He is, and we will be like Him as a result of that knowing. So as much as we know of God, we are able to become like Him. Does that make sense to all of you? Yeah. As much as we understand and see God, we can begin to apply the characteristics or the character of God in our own lives through the work of the Holy Ghost, through the work of the Word of God, and through the preaching of God's Word. Right. And uh, we can choose to apply those things in our lives and become just a little bit more like Jesus Christ in this world. Right. Amen. Amen. I want to be like Him. Yeah. Yeah. That's the bottom line. I want to be like Jesus. I hope today that you want to be like Jesus. Amen. I hope today that there is an innate desire in you that struggles with that. Oh, I want to be like him. That becomes desperate at times when you see the, the error in your own lives, the, the way your thoughts go, and sometimes the way that you react and act towards others, that you just 
striving and want, oh Lord, I, I need to be more like you. Amen. God, I need to know you better. I, I need to learn about forgiveness. I need to learn about a whole lot of things in my life so I can be like you. So we determined the character of God. I went through a session of, of messages on this that God is love. I think about three or four uh, just a while back last year. And uh, so we can determine God God is love. He's not just, He doesn't just love us. He is love. It's a part of His character. It's a part of His makeup. Right. And uh, we know that because the Bible says, For God so loved that He gave. And, and so we determine God's love, not by the fact that it says that He loves us, but by the fact that He gave Himself a sacrifice for us. Amen. His actions exhibited His love. Yes, amen. And uh, likewise, in your own lives, you're going to find out that uh, lots of parents will say that they love their kids and then are, are absolutely, you know, don't apply any restrictions to the life, just give them everything and anything they want. I'm sorry, that's not love. That's right. Love is, is putting guidelines on people's lives to protect them from the things that are going to harm them down the road. And eventually you're able to allow them freedom as they earn it right, right. by action. Amen. And or people just ignore their kids. Yeah. Yeah. Say they love them, but they don't do anything about it. Yeah. Not. So uh, we can determine that in our lives. The Bible says that, that God is just. And I know that oftentimes we struggle with this concept of God, that, that there would be anybody that would go to hell. We struggle with that concept because we think, how do the two correlate? How do you propose that God is love and then have hell on one side that is torment? But let me, can I tell you this? My pastor used to say these words and it's absolutely true. God is just in all of his judgments. Right. right. There will be nobody in hell that does not belong there. But let me put it on the other side. There will be nobody in heaven that does not belong there. Because you see, our God is just. Not only is He just, but He has knowledge. He knows our lives, whether good or bad. He knows your actions, your thoughts, your reactions. He knows everything there is to know about you. And when He makes His judgments, whether at the coming of the rapture, when the church is going to be taken out of here, or the white throne judgment a thousand years later when he's going to divide aside the, the sheep from the goats and, and all of that's going to take place. Understand something about God. God will make the right judgment. Amen. Because he's God. And everybody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. You don't need to worry about it. Let God take care of it. You don't need to start fussing and fighting about it and arguing about it and getting divided about it because you've got to leave this in God's court. This is God's department. And God is quite capable of taking the online department all by himself and do a good job of it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is honest. It is impossible for God to lie. So we know that God has integrity. If he says something, it will come to pass. Right. Right. And you can see that in the different prophecies that he gave. They have come to pass. And so it will be also that the end times will come to pass in accordance with the way God has determined and already right. told us that it will. God is faithful. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You guys aren't real excited today, are you? <laughs> we cry. You guys are okay? Yeah. Listen, if that doesn't make you excited that God is faithful, there's something wrong with your exciter button. Yeah, that's right. Because it's only His faithfulness, by His faithfulness, that all of us are able to come into a church, lift up holy hands and worship Him. We have no holiness of our own. It's His faithfulness, His holiness. We have no righteousness of our own. It's His righteousness. It's that Pray around here. Just 
Thank God for his faithfulness. Amen. Thank you, Lord, that he didn't turn around and turn away from me when I erred. Right. You were right there with your hand to pick me back up again and set me on my feet again. For he who began a good work in you, yeah. Yeah. he began a good work in you, will be faithful right. to complete it. I'm glad my God is faithful. Amen. 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 We can, uh, uh, we've gotten to our, our, our preaching point today. Our God is merciful. Amen. Our God is merciful. I know that in past times and in uh, probably not too long ago in the past if you went into a church oftentimes the preaching had, they had a lot to do with God's judgments and the viewpoint of God even during the time that I was growing up as a child was kind of skewed. Uh, you know, that, that song we sang in Sunday school, you know, there's a father up above who's looking down in love, so careful little eyes what you sing. I always worried about that, you know? <laughs> I see Lenore smiling, so I know this has affected a few other people. I thought, yeah, I can just wait for me to do something wrong so you can squash me <laughs> and, uh, and beat on me. Well, the perception of our God is skewed sometimes by the way that the message comes across. Yes, there's judgment. But you know what? God's looking for a way to show mercy. Amen. Right. Can I tell you that today, and, and, and if you get nothing else from this message, that I want you to know today that God's looking for ways to be merciful in your life. Right. He's seeking for mercy. He's seeking for just a sign that you're going to say yes to Him. Just a sign that there will be repentance in your life. And God will show you mercy. Yeah. Uh, and, and so we know that our God is merciful. In fact, as the Bible says that that uh, let uh, that His mercy is from everlasting to everlasting to those that fear Him, and uh, so we know that our God is merciful. But before we get into that part of the message that I want to talk to you about today, we need to also discuss our mercy, because this is kind of critical to God's mercy. Yes, it is. The fact is, if you don't have this beforehand, God's mercy will not be available to you. Because it's absolutely imperative in each one of our lives that we have mercy. Right. Amen. And I said imperative in our lives that we have mercy. Uh, we have got to show mercy to others. In fact, it is so much so that uh, Proverbs 3 and 3 says, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of your heart. Hold it. Do you, do you know what that was when, when they used to bind stuff around their wrists or their neck or their forehead? It was when they found something in God's Word that they needed to keep with them all the time and remember that if they should forget it, they could look at their wrists and there it was. I need mercy in my life. I need to show mercy in my life. I need to make sure that I don't judge others, that I'm merciful towards those that are around me. And so it was to put it around their neck that we have this verse hanging around their neck that they were to have mercy shown all the time. It's good to have things written in their heart. Amen. And I like that part that it says it should be in their hearts as well. But can I tell you, we need reminders that it's not just supposed to be inside, but it's supposed to be shown on the outside. If we say we have mercy towards others in our heart, but then we're judgmental at the first sign of somebody coming and doing us wrong, then what's in our heart hasn't gotten through to the outside. The Bible talks about, Jesus talked about that first you clean the inside, then the whole will be clean. It doesn't mean that, that, that that's all you have to do, because what's in your heart should be exhibited in your character by what you do. So if there's holiness inside of you, there's going to be a holiness that's going to show through in the way that you live your life. Amen. Amen. If there's integrity inside your heart, it's going to show through. If it doesn't show through, then probably it hasn't got a very good seat in your heart. It hasn't got a very good powerful part. It's somewhere hidden off in the corner. But it hasn't got that part that shows on the outside. And so you can usually tell character and you can tell mercy by it by the fact that it shows through. Micah 6 and 8 says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee. Require of thee. <coughs> to do justly, and to love mercy, mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Jesus said, because I, I hear this sometimes, oh, we've got to go by the words of Jesus, 
Well, let's do that then. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, merciful. for they shall obtain mercy. So, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Luke chapter 6 and verse 36 says this. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. God's mercy and forgiveness of us, and you'll notice this in Scripture and the Lord's Prayer and various other Scriptures, that God's mercy towards us and His forgiveness of us forgive us our debtors as we forgive those that trespass against us. So the one is dependent upon the other. The fact is, if you go to the one parable that Jesus told where, where uh, this individual was... Uh, um, oh boy, now my mind just went blank. I hate that when that happens. <laughs> Where he had owed his master a certain debt, and he came before his master and asked for forgiveness, and the master forgave him his debt. Yeah. And then he went out because there were others that owed him, and he started to beat them. Yeah. And that he may require of them what they owed him. That he came back before his master, and his master said to him, All that you owed me is now due and payable. It's the only place in the Bible where you see, the only place in the Bible where you can see that what has been forgiven an individual will be placed back upon that individual again. The only place. Because our forgiveness from God and our mercy is dependent upon us showing mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. How many times the disciples asked Jesus, should we forgive? After seven times? Seventy times seven. Seventy times seven. Now, one minister that knows a whole lot more Greek than any of us that are sitting here uh, said that that application is not seven times seven, 490 times. But it's 490 times, seven times seven, right? It's 490. That's right. We all want to get your calculators and we'll figure out whether I got that right. 490 times. It's 490 times in one day for the same offense. Right. The same person. The same person, same offense. So let's use somebody here. Let's use one of my grandchildren. Ethan. So Ethan. Oh, I know Kyle says no. So Ethan, Ethan gets up in the morning and uh, says something rude to his father. It wouldn't happen. These are good kids, just so you know. Uh, and I uh, forgive them. And, and he would have to do that from him alone, not somebody else, if I had decided she wanted to join in. <laughs> you know, at some point in time. Then i got to start over again, counting. And it would be terrible, you know, you get close to midnight, and he's at, what is it, 490 or 488. And it goes over yeah. to the next day. And i got to start all over again. That's right. <laughs> and it's no wonder that the disciples said after this, Oh God, you've got to increase our faith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have enough faith for that on my own. Well, I need God to do that. And I think that's the whole principle of that whole parable. We need God to help us with this. Amen. Amen. When you don't find enough mercy in your lives to be able to forgive those you find yourself with heart failure. You find yourself hating. Or you find yourself in conflict. It is because you haven't learned to forgive. That's right. That's right. That's true. And we don't have it in us. Yeah. I don't have it in me to forgive him 490 times for the same offense in the same day. It's impossible to me. Yeah. Right. God needs to help me. Because somewhere along the line, I'm just going to get mad and say, Ethan, that's yeah. it. You're out of here. I'm putting you on a ferry. You're going home. Let mom and dad take care of you. Yeah. <laughs> That's, That's, what you like. That's what I love. That's exactly right. <laughs> so we need to show mercy in order to receive mercy from God. And we needed to touch on that because it is absolutely essential that we show mercy to people. I want to just talk to you for a moment. If somebody comes in this church that has issues that we have issues with. Everybody paying attention? We're not going to talk about it. We're not going to advertise it. What we're going to do is we're going to extend mercy. Amen. Because they need salvation as much as all of us. 
That's right. Amen. 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 We need salvation in our lives. And so it's very imperative that we show that kind of mercy to anyone who should come in. Amen. But I, I would propose to you today that, that God is seeking today for a way to show mercy to each one of us. That God is seeking to show mercy to all of those that are around us in this world right now. Right. Can I tell you today that as I know and understand the scriptures, our God is looking for a way that he can bring mercy into these people's lives that, that don't know him and need him so desperately in their lives. That God is looking for a way and a means and, a, and just any sort of an opening in their lives that he can show mercy. He did it for us. Amen. Amen. Right. I wasn't even looking for God. Right. And he came looking for me. Amen. And he opened yeah. the door. as much as that one song and it just kept going over and there was a little bit of a gap in my heart and in my mind and God moved in with mercy. Amen. 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 What would a great God we serve. Amen. Amen. Seeking for mercy. If you err and you're, you're living for God and you make mistakes in that, understand something. God's just looking for the least little inkling from you that you want to live for Him, that you want to make things right to come in with mercy in your Amen. life. Amen. It's only when we resist that Amen. presence of God and hold it at bay that we run into trouble in our lives. Okay. Psalm 103 and 17 says, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him, and His righteousness is unto the children's children. I have prayed this so many times. I know my wife has. Any of you who have children and grandchildren, pray this. Pray this prayer. The sure mercies of David will be extended down to my right. children, my right. grandchildren. If I should have great grandchildren, I'm going to pray that the sure mercies of Ron Nickel will extend down to my great grandchildren. Right. I want God's mercy upon them all. Amen. I want God's righteousness yes. in their life. Yes. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says this. It says, the Lord's mercy is that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Amen. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. What a great song that is. And that yes. all comes from that passage of Scripture in Lamentation. Micah chapter 7 verse 18 says, He delighted in mercy. God delights in mercy. Amen. Aren't you glad that God delights in mercy? Amen. 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 Right. Hallelujah. So we go to the passage of Scripture that I read. And the Bible talks about how Cain and Abel both came and uh, they offered up a sacrifice to God. Most of you know the, the story from the Bible and you know how Abel brought a sheep and a uh, blood offering, a blood sacrifice. And, and Cain didn't raise sheep. He was a farmer. He brought the fruit of the field and, and came and offered that to, to God as a, uh, an offering. And uh, God wasn't very happy with Cain. Because you see, they knew that it was going to require blood sacrifice. Because it's only through the blood, the shedding of blood, that there is any sort of forgiveness of sin. And so Cain brought the wrong one, and God wasn't very happy with him. But can I tell you that that God was looking for Cain to make things right? Yeah. Yeah. God was not looking for him to kill his brother. There's a door that's open for Cain today. Or there was a map there for him to do the right thing. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll go up and get the sacrifice that's required of you before you go. Right. I'll go make a deal with my brother who raises sheep and I'll give him some of the fruit of the fields in exchange for the lamb that is required. And I'll come and make the right sacrifice. Don't you know that all of history would have been changed if he had done yeah. that? Yeah. Because God was looking to show mercy yeah. to a man that, that had done wrong. Go to the passage of scripture in, in uh, Jonah that I read to you from chapter 3 and verse 10. And God saw the works. Now, all of you need to, to know that Nineveh, if you study history or you look at some of the things that, that it talks about the way the city of Nineveh was, it was a 
desperately wicked city. It wasn't that they were just, you know, so, so bad. This was a desperately wicked city. So much that, that uh, one pastor was preaching, he was talking about, he said, when they would take the prophets that were sent to them and, and they would skin them alive and they would tear them apart with animals and they'd do all of this stuff. This place was not just moderately wicked. It, they had reached a place where, where God had says, that's it, I'm going to destroy them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My judgments are sure. I don't see any future up ahead for these people that is not wicked and evil and, and harmful to all of those their children and anybody that enters in that city. I'm done with them and I'm going to destroy them. And he called Jonah and you know the whole story of Jonah and how he got there and he began to preach. Jonah wanted them to be judged. Yeah. Yeah. So when he began to preach, he says, you've got, I can't remember how many days, you've got so many days to repent. All right, you've got so many, no, he doesn't even say that, does he? He just says, God's going to destroy this city. The whole city went and sackcloth and ashes and repented before the Lord. Right. Now God's looking where he had not seen. And I know God knows the beginning from the end, and I know, I know he knows the future, but I know also that God was tired of their sin. Right. Right. God's looking to show mercy to that city. He doesn't want to kill that city. He doesn't want to destroy that city. He wants to find a way. God is seeking for mercy for Nineveh. And when they repented and placed themselves in sackcloth and ashes, God changed his mind. Right. And the Bible says the word repent in this instant means turned around and go the other way from his intended purpose. God changed his intended purpose for Nineveh and showed them mercy. In John chapter 8, and this passage of scripture, I'll finish with this. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, it talks about a woman that was brought to Jesus. The Bible says that, that she was caught in the very act of adultery. I, I went back when I was studying for this message, and I went back to the Old Testament to find out the law regarding adultery. And the Bible talks about that, that the man that commits it, as well as the woman, are to be so, they're to be killed, according to the Old Testament law. And uh, so the question always arose in my mind, where is the man? Yeah. Why just the woman was, was brought? And I'll tell you why. I think it was a setup. I think she was set up. And I think that uh, she probably came from a marriage that was probably at the end of the rope for her and she was still in that and and that she was set up by the guy and they let him go and took her. I cannot see any situation and circumstance where a bunch of soldiers in San Peter and Council would be able to come into a place yeah. and not be able to grab hold of them. I don't see any situation where that could have happened. But they brought her before Jesus. <clears throat> And uh, they did it, the Bible says in John, so that they might trick him and trap him. And I'll, I'll explain why in just a few moments. They brought her to him, and, uh, and I just can imagine that there was already, you know, they already were ready. Sure. Generally, you know, when they stoned somebody, they were prepared to do it. There were stones that were handy. If there weren't any in the street, they would have brought them with them. Because, you see, they wanted to do this right away. They wanted to be a judgment. They were trying to trap Jesus. And I have to think to myself, the reason they thought this would be a problem for him was because they had detected that the character and the personality of Jesus was to try and find a place in mercy. Yeah. And so I have to believe that they knew this would be an issue for him and that they would trap him into saying, oh, well, it doesn't matter about the Old Testament law. Yeah. So they come, brought this woman before him. She's standing there, her head's down. She's grabbed some clothes and wrapped herself up and trying to cover herself the best that she can. She's standing there in a public square and uh, all these men standing around, ready and waiting. Can I say that they were probably filled with adrenaline and zeal and all the rest of these things. Wow, we're going to do We're going to kill her. Because she committed that. 
So they ask him, Jesus, what sayest thou in regards to this situation? Jesus crouches down, starts writing in the sand before I'm on the ground. And they're all standing there waiting for his words to come. <coughs> Without even looking up, let him, without sin, cast the first star. He goes back to the sand. Silence is so complete in the square. Each man in that moment and in those words I believe the conviction and power of God came down upon them revealed to them the sin that was in their lives let him who is without sin let him cast the first stone one by one you hear the dropping of stones on the ground Jesus isn't even looking up anymore but can I tell you what the dilemma was? Because the problem is, is that if Jesus had negated that Old Testament law before that law came to an end and the new dispensation had been brought in, then they could say, well, none of the law matters anymore and therefore you yeah. have committed, what's the word, blasphemy. Yeah. So he never did it. Yeah. He never negated the Old Testament law. He just said, that's the way you are. If you've committed no sin, go ahead, throw a stone. And throughout the square, stones dropped to the ground. And Jesus looked up from where he was writing in his sand. Woman, where are your accusers? Go out for the Holy Ghost right now. There are no answers. Neither do I condemn you. Jesus, and I, I know that he probably knew what he was going to do. Just bear with me for a moment, will you? Just for, just for a little bit. This is a situation where I want to show mercy. But if I just negate the Old Testament law, that's going to bring too many questions in. How am I going to show mercy? to this woman and still not negate all those things that were written in the Old Testament. You see, Jesus exhibited the heart of God by seeking for a way to show mercy to this woman. And he wants to do that in all of our lives. Stand together in the position of God. serve a God today that is anxious. Anxious to find a place. Showing mercy in our lives. I, uh, I thought in preparing this message I thought about myself, my own life. And I thought about that moment. That just a tiny little bit of reaction. And you know what? That's exactly what God is looking for. Just a crack. Just a crack in that facade that we put on the barriers that we build up. So that He can come in and show mercy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For those of you who are here today, and then maybe it's not the case, maybe, maybe everything is well with you and, and you have. No reason to come to an altar to just receive God's mercy in your life. Perhaps we just need to all come and just.